Have you ever wanted to see what the world looks like in French? Boy, have I. Whoa, it's uh, pretty much the same. Have you ever heard that people who speak other languages literally see the world differently? It's a common idea, and it goes by the name linguistic relativity or the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The name comes from Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf, who were two linguists working in the early 20th century. In 1931, Sapir studied the language of the Nootka people, who are a group indigenous to Canada's Pacific Northwest coast. He observed that the grammar of the Nootka people had a distinctive feature. Instead of saying the stone falls, they would say it stones down. Sapir claimed that this small distinction meant that the Nuka people saw the relationship between the object and the object's action differently than speakers of other languages. Benjamin Lee Whorf, one of Sapir's students, expanded on this idea. He did a study of the Hopi people, a Native American tribe living in northeastern Arizona. Whorf determined that the Hopi language had no grammar to deal with time, and so the Hopi people then had no concept of time. It's like, time doesn't exist. This conclusion would mean that the Hopi people think of the world just entirely differently, and from this the Sapir Whorf hypothesis was born. Only one problem, not everyone was buying this. Eckhart Malotki, a linguist working in the second half of the 20th century, wrote a book called Hopi Time, in which he went into a lot of detail about the many, many ways the Hopi people actually do talk about time. When this book was published in the 1980s, it largely discredited this part of Whorf's work, and was kind of the final nail in the coffin for the Sapir Whorf hypothesis. <laughs> or was it? While pretty much everyone agrees that it's impossible for your very concept of time to be changed by native language, there is a version of this hypothesis that does have some support. The old, mostly debunked version of this is called the strong hypothesis, which says that our language determines how we see the world. Kind of like the famous Ludwig Wittgenstein quote, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. The newer, more accepted version is the weak hypothesis, which says that our language just influences how we see the world. There is evidence for this. One study looked at grammatical gender, which is when a language labels a noun to be masculine or feminine or whatever. As an aside, English doesn't really have this. This study asked people who spoke different languages to describe various objects like a bridge. In German, bridge is feminine, die Brücke, and German study participants used words like beautiful and slender more often to describe it. In Spanish, where bridge is the masculine el puente, adjectives tended to be things more like strong and dangerous. This study, though not entirely conclusive, seems to show that a language's grammatical gender can influence how people think about objects. Some of that bridge over there is just so... sexy. Another study that took on the subject a little more rigorously explored how Russian people see the color blue. While English has one basic word for all the shades of blue, Russian has two. Shini for dark blues and Gulaboy for light blues. The format of the study is a bit complicated, but basically they were trying to find out if Russian speakers could actually see a difference between Chini and Goloboy that English speakers don't. And they found that, yes, the Russian participants were able to tell the difference between light blue and dark blue slightly faster. And so the researchers concluded that the language then had a statistically significant influence on the way Russians see color. So speaking purely scientifically, linguistic relativity does exist. But before we go too far, the difference between English and Russian responses in this study was mere millisecond. Which probably means it doesn't have much of an effect on day-to-day -day life. And while there have been quite a few studies by researchers who have dubbed themselves Neo-Warfians that have tried to show links between language and worldview, there have been very few concrete connections. But there is something inherently compelling in this idea that language can make us engage with the world differently. We almost want to believe that a person who speaks a different language must have a different experience. A strong counterpoint to the Sapir Whorf hypothesis has been made by present-day linguist John McWhorter. He argues that the hypothesis actually reinforces certain prejudices against foreign language speakers. After all, when someone says people who speak language X are better at doing Y, that also means inversely that there are other people who are worse at doing Y. Sapir Whorf would also imply that people who speak a different language from you are somehow not even able to imagine the world the same way that you do. That's not great. Language doesn't have to divide the world into neat, separate worldviews for it to teach us something important about humanity. It's a refreshing thought, really, that we're all here seeing the world pretty much the same in spite of our linguistic and cultural differences. In fact, it might be the one thing that truly unites us.